Okay, uh, hi everyone, thanks for joining the session. Um, my name is Pete Burnett, I'm Professor of Data Science and Cybersecurity at Cardiff University, where I lead the Centre for Cybersecurity Research. Um, I'm going to give a talk today on some of the work that we've been doing using applied machine learning um, for cybersecurity innovation, particularly looking at uh, how, how we use machine learning but to both detect attacks and also uh, respond to them in real time. And I'll give you some information about how we're doing that. Just to give you an overview of sort of the context of this, so the cybersecurity landscape, um, the UK has its national cybersecurity strategy, which is actually about to be renewed, um, and out of that sprung the uh, National Cybersecurity Centre, which is essentially a public-facing arm of GCHQ that's working with with individuals right up to large businesses and everything in between to keep the UK safe and secure. Um, in parallel, I suppose, the government's also launched its industrial strategy uh, with, with various grand challenges. And, and within that, there is a, the uh, artificial intelligence and the data economy theme. Um, the work that we do really is to, is to sort of drive uh, cybersecurity and safety in the online context through our research around uh, artificial intelligence and applied machine learning. Um, and so we're very complementary to both the, the national cybersecurity strategy and the, um, and the industrial strategy. So I use this term cybersecurity analytics a lot. And, and just to give you a bit of context for that and what I mean by that, it, it's essentially not just data. It's about how we use various uh, interdisciplinary insights and, and uh, methodological approaches to, to analyze data and draw conclusions from it. So, um, you know, the, the, the most obvious one is, is computational mathematical models. So machine learning, AI, big data analytics, whatever you want to call it, essentially using um, uh, statistical models to, to, to understand data. But we don't really just want to use a sort of a black box approach to that. And, and we were sort of trying to feel in, feed in uh, interdisciplinary insights, both at the start of that process and, and at the end of it. So to give some examples, we do a lot with the criminology department, so uh, with uh, who have a sort of a knowledge of cyber crime and why people commit cyber attacks and 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 why they respond in certain ways. So we'll feed that into the to the thinking around how we frame the data, uh, both in terms of how we feed it into the algorithm and both in terms of the algorithmic output. Similarly, from a psychology perspective, we'll start to think about susceptibility to cyber threats, both as individuals and corporate culture. And again, we'll try and use data that reflects those potential features um, of individuals and of, of corporate uh, organizations and really try and use that to understand, can these data points be used to infer cyber attacks and, and can we do something about it in a way that's actually going to mean that uh, the, the intelligence, the, the early warning, if you like, around cyber attack can be action and we can actually do something about it. And that last one leads into our international relations expertise, understanding communication and governance and so on. So the whole concept of cybersecurity analytics is intended to bring all of these various um, things together. A really brief overview of, of the research at Cardiff University for those interested. I'm really going to focus on the last pillar here, the artificial intelligence and data driven approaches to uh, cyber threat intelligence. But we also do a lot around risk assessment and modeling, uh, also communication, governance and decision making. And you'll see that whole uh, AI um, risk communication, risk assessment and modeling is a, is a sort of a directed loop. So we start to try and understand the problem from a risk perspective, understand how that we could communicate that, make decisions use the AI to detect the attack and feed that back around to a risk assessment. So we're trying to create living, breathing risk assessments rather than sort of static approaches. And we're also trying to do something with the output of our AI rather than just flag a warning and turn some red lights on. We're trying to action that and turn it into something that can be used to uh, address the, 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 the attack. You'll see cutting through everything at the top is human factors. Um, and I mentioned both criminology and psychology uh, earlier on. So we're really trying to understand how susceptibility, motivations, dynamics, all these various aspects play into risk, communication, governance and cyber attacks themselves. Cutting through everything top down is emerging tech. So we've applied this to I IoT, cloud, operational technology, automotive, uh, enterprise networks, you name it. Essentially, all of these different environments have different contexts, different human factors, different risks. So it gives us a you know, really broad playing field to to try and develop these um, these approaches. So I'll move on for to the to the main um, content of the of the talk now. And and, and what I'm really going to talk about is uh, advanced cybersecurity operation centers, in particular uh, our work with Airbus. Our work with Airbus is is, is quite deep now. So we we host um, 
Airbus is only center of excellence for cybersecurity analytics. Um, that's that's sort of grown out of a number of different projects and programs. Um, we're lucky enough to be very closely located to um, to Airbus, and so we've been able to do secondments and have PhD placements and, and funded researchers um, move across the sites regularly. And, and really, that's driven a lot of this work into uh, the you know the application of some of the research into into practice. And um, the, the research has led to, to some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today. So to frame the problem, um, everyone has network intrusion detection systems. Everyone has antivirus tools. We've all got them on our own computers at home. Everyone hopefully will have them in the office and corporate environment. Um, these work by either doing network data analysis, looking at the data coming into the network and trying to identify attack traffic within that. Um, antivirus tools attempt to, to take um, bits of code that come into the, uh, to, to, to the network and match those against code that it's seen previously that is known to be malicious. And when you see those sorts of fingerprints, uh, you flag the, the potential software as malicious. Um, however, uh, these have been around for quite a while and attackers are sort of developing more and more sophisticated approaches to try and work around this particular these particular approaches, which is problematic for both individuals and corporate environments. So APTs or advanced persistent threats are uh, essentially bits of software that sit on your network and on your devices for a long period of time. And, and they are sophisticated and hidden. Um, they do stuff in memory, they encrypt their code base, they uh, do things essentially to try and um, evade detection by static signature analysis or, um, or, or, or network uh, traffic analysis by essentially obfuscating them, themselves to, to those sorts of tools. So this presents us with a brand new problem to think about, okay, so you know we've got various ways of, of monitoring systems and, and networks. And the picture here is a picture of a security operations center, which is essentially collecting data from network traffics and from uh, individual devices. And it, it's, it's doing that process essentially of trying to identify malicious uh, behavior and do something about it. Um, however, lots of these types of environments still use the off-the-shelf antivirus or, or look at high-level behavior analysis of the of exact type, as I was mentioning earlier, vulnerable to obfuscation and, and uh, being avoided by the, by the detectors. So um, the question we sort of asked uh, some years back now is how, how do we enable SOX, future SOX, to learn what is malicious in this context without having to depend on things like static code analysis? And, and there, there was a, the, a paper that analyzed the, uh, what, what, what they called the big, big four sort of uh, APTs um, a few years back, where they're essentially saying, you know, if you want to do something on a system, um, exfiltrate some data or, or, or manipulate some of the devices that are on the network, you've got to do something. I mean, you can't, you can't do it without leaving a, a trace behind. Um, and, and therefore, we, we, we sort of started to think, well, you know, well, what data can we collect from these environments then that would allow us to distinguish malicious from trusted activity using what the paper called low severity events? So things that are inevitably generated while an executable or a PDF or um, any of those types of things is running on, on, a, on a device. So things like you know the, the, the processor use, um, both as an individual user and system wide, the memory that's being used, the, the packets in terms of received and, and, and outgoing that are um, part of the network flow, uh, sent bytes, sent packets, the number of processes that are running on the, on the device. So actually it's quite a small number, only nine metrics in total, but we're able to collect these all the time. And of course you can't hide these because they are what they are. They are essentially attributes of the system. So we thought, well, can we use machine learning then to use these, these different types of uh, data and, and actually train it to, to recognize what is malicious? So in theory, what we're trying to create here is this sort of DNA model, if you like, of, of malicious behavior. Um, if you can imagine a sort of parent-child similarity, that there are going to be characteristics or features of the DNA profile that, that, that are evident if you overlay them. So given that malware is changing all the time and given that potentially some of the behavior is obfuscated or encrypted or hidden in some way, in theory, what it does on the system should be similar across various different types of malware, even if we can't actually see what's going on, because it should leave that footprint behind that, that trace of behavior. So this was the sort of principle that we are working towards. How we did this was essentially to try and use a, a competitive learning approach. So we used... Um, something called self-organizing feature maps. I won't go into the, the detail of it, but, but, but ultimately 
it compresses the dimensionality from from nine different features down to two and and is able to organize these in a sort of an xy fashion as you can see here you've got malicious activity on the right in red and 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 sort of clean and acceptable activity on the left in in green this is generated from running thousands of samples of both malicious and benign activity in a in a sort of a uh, sandboxed but representative IT corporate IT environment and collecting all the data around processes CPU memory use packets bytes etc uh, and essentially reducing them to two dimensions whereby um, nodes or cells are here you can see the grid approach on here that cells that are closer together exhibit similar levels of CPU use for example um, cells that are further apart have, have slightly different but of course we're considering all nine dimensions down to two so you're looking at um, areas that are very close together and bright. So bright areas um, are also representative of frequently seen types of behavior. So what you've got here, um, if you take the example on the, on the red side, in the middle circle, you've got a cluster of frequently seen malicious behavior that exhibits similar properties in terms of its CPU use, its memory use, its packets and bytes in and out of the network. So in theory, if a piece of malware came into the system and we ran it and we plotted it in this environment and it was exactly the same as the sort of profile of the samples that we'd seen in that cluster, it would then emerge that the new uh, uh, sort of file belongs in that cluster and we could say that it's similar to that. So we, we essentially do that with any new uh, file that then comes into the system and we can consider whether, first of all, does it better match the objects or the cells on the good map or the bad map? i.e. is it malicious or benign more likely and if once we've made that decision what type of software is it more like as i say we've essentially got this method then that can take behavior of of, of software over um five minutes initially we ran it in a sort of a, a realistic but sandbox environment for five minutes um you can see on the on the left hand side there um this a sort of representation i suppose of, of frequency uh, or you know volume of of activity um, different amounts of CPU use going up and down throughout. Similarly, for memory use, there's a, there's a particular high portion of memory, about 20% uh, of the way in, that then drops off again. So this is all sort of representing sort of part of the behavior. So we get thousands and thousands and thousands of those. And if you actually compress them just into two by, uh, yeah, essentially a 50 by 50 two-dimensional grid, you get what we got on the left-hand side at the bottom. So this uh, essentially multi-colored picture here is representative of multiple different colors, red, green, blue, and yellow. This is what it looks like before they're all sorted if you just sort of randomly pull them together. But the process is to run through that data um, hundreds of times essentially to organize them into similar entities. So, you know, a decent analogy is this color scheme here where you've got red, green, blue, yellow, very nicely sorted into the different areas, but with some overlapping edges between them. So as an analogy, this works for different types of malware, different types of cleanware and overlaps between them. So this learning algorithm is the way that we've been able to detect, if you like, this sort of form of DNA. So in practice, then, what does that mean? So we've essentially put this into, into practice with thousands of samples. We build our trained model, we learn, we train our model with thousands of samples. We bring a new one in, we deploy it. We take a snapshot then every second when it enters the network. And we do the mapping exercise I just described from basically determining whether it belongs on the, the good behavior or the bad behavior. And if so, um, if, it's, if it's bad, it ends up on the red. If it's, if it's good, it ends up on the green. And then we're looking for the cell that matches the um, behavior most similarly in terms of most frequently seen. What we then do is we basically take that XY coordinate and map that into a machine learning algorithm, which, which effectively then determines whether it's malicious or benign. And in practice, we've been able to determine that this can be determined to distinguish between malicious and benign activity with 94% accuracy. So not perfect, but very good. One issue with this approach though, is, is essentially does, does the, will this work on, on unseen data? So what we've done here is we've trained a machine learning model to recognize the difference between malicious and blind activity with 94% accuracy um, on a particular data set. So one of the things that we're you know, very keen on is obviously deploying something that will work longer term. Um, i.e. if we see another data set, will it still work? Or will next week's malware mean that this model is out of date? Or maybe next year's malware, you know, how long will this last? So what we decided to do, first of all, was to look at uh, malware from different points in time. Um, and we also uh, did a comparison between our approach, which was to use these machine metrics, these sort of uh, uh, 
uh, inescapable footprints left behind by, by bits of software. And we, and we compared those features to API calls. So API calls are basically um, calls between the software that's running on the computer and the underlying operating system. Um, uh, they basically tell the computer what to do and probably say 98% of the academic literature uses API calls. The problem with API calls, though, is that uh, as software changes and as software, you know, essentially is programmed in a different way, uh, these calls to the underlying operating system change or are absent. They're not there at all. So what it does is it leaves you with a quite a, what you might call a sparse feature vector. So um, if you take the example here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine possible features. Um, only two of the API calls might be present, whereas the machine metrics, they're always there. You've always got CPU use, you've always got memory use, you've always got network traffic. So the comparison is really, does it still work over time? And what's the difference between using machine metrics and API calls? We did some experiments around this. And what we've got here is three different types of machine learning approach. So a, a random forest on the left, which is a form of decision tree, a support vector machine in the middle, and a neural network on the right-hand side at the bottom. The blue dots represent the training of, of this. Um, and the orange dots represent the data set from a different point in time that was completely un unseen during training and actually was seen much, much later in time. Now, each chart has a comparison of the API call approach uh, on the left at the bottom of the chart, the machine metrics, and then a combination. So each image you have there has got the, the blue dots for the uh, training data, the orange dots for the unseen different time data, and three columns essentially rep in API calls machine-based metrics and everything. Um, and what you can see for basically for all three models is that there is a big drop in performance for the API calls for each different type of model. It goes from up in the 90s down to you know, late 60s, early 70s for all three different types of model. Whereas for the machine metrics approach, actually it's fairly stable, stable around uh, the sort of early 80s um, mark um, for all three different types of approach. Combining them um, pushes the, the training data back up again, but as you can see, the API call being in the decision-making process is actually pulling it back down again. So what we're finding is that the machine metrics are somewhat resilient over time. They do drop a little bit, um, but they are much more resilient, it seems, it would appear, than the API call metrics, which constitute a large part of the the actual academic literature. So quite an important finding on that one. And it, and it shows actually that the machine activity is robust and you know, potentially deployable for, for a longer term. So fine, okay, so we can detect attacks. We can do that quite well. We can do that using machine learning. The next question was, well, we're doing this though on 30 seconds worth of data. So we have to run a file and we collect the data every second for 30 seconds worth to make that decision. Okay, fine. But of course, making a decision 30 seconds into something potentially means that the file itself was already executed. And while you now know there is malware on your network, it's, you have to do something about it. You have to remediate the problem. So we started thinking about, well, could we do this earlier then? Detect this actual behavior earlier on, like within seconds of the, the malware starting to run on the system such that we can actually do something about it. So what we did is, is to train a, a neural network, as you can see here, and the, the various inputs are being highlighted now, the CPU use, they, they go into the network, the network then makes a, a complex decision making process and the output is whether it's malicious or benign. On the right hand side, you can see every second it's giving you an answer and a confidence level. Here it's 100% sure it's benign all the way through and at the end, it turns out it is actually benign. The next example, it's actually swinging between malicious and benign over the first few seconds, but it's 99.1% sure it's benign in the end, and it was benign. So actually, you can see the, the decisions are fairly accurate, or very accurate, very quickly. So this potentially means that we can act quicker and be able to respond, particularly to certain attacks, things like ransomware, um, and be able to respond and, and protect the system rather than having to remediate it later. So we started at five minutes. Uh, that was that's uh, that initial level. Uh, that was 98% accurate with the neural network. So it's already improving on the, the, the self-organizing approach. Uh, at 20 seconds, still 98% accurate, but at five five seconds into the, the, the approach, it drops a little bit 
not to 94%, but 99% of ransomware in a, in a controlled example that we did was detected within one second of execution, which is potentially phenomenal. It's game changing. It means that we can now respond to this stuff much, much quicker, um, given that we now know there is ransomware on the system. However, while we now know there is ransomware on the system, at this point in time, all we're able to say is to the system administrators, you've got malware on your system, and they're not going to be able to respond any quicker than they would normally respond anyway. They only, even if you detected it after one second, this means that we then need some other automated way to, to, to protect the system, to help the system administrator. For example, if they say, if you're 95% confident that it's, that it's ransomware within, say, the first three seconds, do something about it. So this is what we did. This was the next step in the, in the work. What we actually did was um, all uh, software on your computer starts a process. It starts a process that's logged by the computer. That process effectively is running in the background while you're doing your stuff on the screen. Um, if that process is stopped, then your whole application closes. And so the, the key for us was to be able to determine which processes were malicious, which processes were not malicious, and kill the malicious ones as quickly as you possibly could. So we extended the experiment to not only collect the machine activity, but also the underlying processes related to that machine activity when the processes were started. So if I was to, for example, start a, a desktop application, it would open the process and it would log that process. And similarly for a piece of malware, it would do the same. We then monitored the system. We were able to detect, as we've shown in a previous one, um, very, very early on that we were able to detect uh, the, the ransomware within seconds. Um, what we actually did with it then to start to, to kill some of the underlying processes. Now, there's clearly some potential for confusion there because we're using data that's generated on the system through the CPU use and memory use. But of course, there are multiple underlying applications running on your computer at any given time, not just the malware, which is creating additional noise, which is also then driving up or down the CPU use and memory use and network traffic, et cetera. So, we had to write algorithms essentially to try and distinguish between those. So it wasn't perfect. Um, we dropped the, the, the ransomware detection to only 90% rather than the, the 98. Um, but we were able to reduce file encryption in the first sort of piece of work we did on this by 50%. Um, we all, we've actually pushed that up to closer to 80 now. So we're actually able to say we can not only detect ransomware very quickly within the first few seconds of launching, but we can also now actually reduce file encryption by up to 80% while reducing false positives and not killing your word processing applications and your emails, et cetera. Um, we're actually able to sort of balance both, which again is potentially game changing. It gives a, a whole new approach to trying to protect um, files and, 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 uh, and enterprise networks and, uh, and, and devices uh, alike. So brilliant. You know, potentially, and this is this is the stuff that we're trying to work on um, at the moment, and and we're working very closely with with Airbus on this uh, particular approach as well. Um, the next step for us then is to try and think about okay, so we we've got automated detection, we've now potentially got automatic response, and going back to that security operation center or the SOC earlier there's very little likelihood of anyone working in a SOC just accepting a machine learning algorithm takeover. I, mean, you know, I don't think we would ever even want to do that. What we try, need to try and do is augment that particular automation process with people who are already working in that environment. And we've just kicked off another project recently that's looking at both the explainability of um, any of these machine learning algorithms. So to try and say, well, I thought it was ransomware because and actually provide some evidence as to what was actually happening on the system and why it thought it was ransomware. Um, I killed the underlying process because, and again, having a sort of an audit trail for why it's actually decided to make that decision and kill the process. Um, so that's the explainability part to try and increase trust and therefore adoption of some of these approaches. The other side of it is we're trying to look at the adversarial approaches to try and avoid detection again. So I've just spoken about how we're able to detect attacks very early on. So an obvious approach is to try and delay your attack to much further down the line. So you're, it, it, you're not detecting it very early on in, in the execution of a piece of software. Uh, I've also said that we're using different types of machine activity. So potentially CPU use or memory use, for example, might be something that's highly indicative of malware or particular, at least a particular um, set of attributes associated with the CPU and memory use. 
Therefore, it might be possible for attackers to play with and manipulate the CPU and memory use by injecting other non-malicious processes to try and drive up and down the system activity on uh, other, to try and confuse our machine learning approach. So we're also looking at the resilience side of, of machine learning algorithms in terms of trying to uh, better understand that. So explainability and resilience. So the last uh, thing I was going to touch on is the security of the security. And, and what we've got here is uh, on the left hand side, an unaltered data, data test set. So this is this is malware and benignware. Uh, green dots are, um, are benign and the, the red dots are malicious. And you, you can clearly see, although they're not all clustered in one place, there are clear dividing lines between them. So we're clearly able to distinguish the difference between these two based on that behavior. However, on the right hand side, what we've started to do is manipulate that behavior by pushing the CPU, memory use, et cetera, uh, network traffic up and down to try and confuse the model. Now, what we've got now is benign in green, um, identified adversarial approaches. So basically approaches say, hang on a minute, this is a bit, this is very different and this is not what we would expect to see. Those are blue dots here. So we know that, they're, that they are identified as malicious and adversarial, but we've also got a lot of these blue X's. So these blue X's are unidentified adversarial approaches. Essentially, what we've done is manipulate the data to the extent where the algorithm can no longer distinguish between it. So we're now actually getting confusion there and we're missing um, examples of, of uh, malicious activity. So our next step is obviously to try and then detect that and learn how to defend against that. And we've made some inroads in that in terms of uh, industrial control systems. Um, and we've actually been able to try and identify um, this sort of manipulation of data and use that in the training environment so that we can actually know to expect this type of data within it and know a bit more about what it looks like and therefore try and detect the stuff that is adversarial and trying to confuse our approaches. So that's something that we're working on at the moment but ultimately what we're trying to do is advance this work around the automated detection of cyber attacks and the automated response to cyber attacks and get that into practice through developing trusted approaches to this and merging it, fusing it with existing security operation centers by helping to one, show that the model is, is works on different data sets and over time, two, show that the, the, the features are sort of robust and resilient, three, develop trust in both the explainability um, side of it and the resilience side of it. So that we can actually show that we can audit the algorithms and make sure the decisions are making are correct and accurate and also understand the limitations of these approaches and that they're not likely to be manipulated and worked around by attackers which goes right back to the problem we we're starting on in the first place and so that is the end of the talk uh, i believe there'll be some opportunity for questions and i will be online to answer those at the time so thank you very much Good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us for our session at the Cybersecurity Conference on the future of AI in cybersecurity innovation. We're joined this afternoon by Dr. Pete Burnap, um, and my name is Nicola McNeely, um, the Head of Technology Sector at HCR. Good afternoon, uh, Pete. Thank you very much for such an interesting uh, session. Um, we've got some uh, potential uh, opportunities for questions and we've got some free questions here for you so I just wanted to have a little chat with you about a few of those if, if I may. Um, so um, you mentioned that attackers are finding new ways to breach security systems all the time so how likely do you think that the current systems that we have in place uh, will become redundant for businesses over time and much more investment will be needed intelligent systems using AI and machine learning? Yeah, morning. Uh, good, to, good to be here with you. Um, yes. So this is the thing with cybersecurity. I suppose uh, a constant game of, of of cat and mouse. You know, we, we we put security measures in place, and and attackers try and find ways around those. I think um, yes, it's it's always going to be difficult for you know current solutions to to, to keep up with that. Um, I think there's 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 two to two sort of answers to this um the first really starts with the the human factor side I, you know i think first and foremost we we really need to start thinking about how 
how people work and the future of work. And, you know, COVID is a perfect example of how, you know, this has changed rapidly over the last 12 months. We've seen a very different way uh, in which people connect to their to their data, to their devices, to their colleagues. Um, and that's given us massive cybersecurity challenges. And, and first and foremost, we need to make sure that we put a an infrastructure in place that people can work in securely. Um, technology is certainly not the answer to everything. Um, and and I think it's it's really important to consider consider that and make sure that we've we've got a, a, you know a system that works for everyone. People are different; they have individual differences, and we need to make sure we consider that. Um, to complement that, uh, I think intelligent systems are going to be really important. Um, I think you know devices are becoming more and more interconnected. Uh, the ways in people in which people work again is more twenty four seven now. Is much more internationalization, of course, as well. Uh, more connectivity to cloud. You know, so having people defending increasingly large infrastructures is, is going to be very, very difficult to, to manage. And so having a sort of an AI based or an autonomous system in there to an extent to to flag issues, to, to, to take some small level of, of automated control um, is, is, is going to be vital. But the key challenge, I suppose, is how do we integrate that you know, autonomous intelligent system that is algorithmic with the intelligence of, of people who are on the front line defending systems all the time as well. It's going to be a really interesting challenge. Mm, yeah, fascinating. So um, you, you, if you were to predict the future of AI and cybersecurity, what do you think it'll look like? You know, where will we, we be in 10, 10 years time? 10 years time. So, so I think... <laughs> You know, if, if I was writing a sci-fi movie and predicting the, the, the future of AI and cybersecurity, you know, I think you'd have algorithms making decisions all the time and, and continually detecting new attacks and, and weaknesses in the system and, and patching those systems and defending against the attacks. I think the reality of that might be somewhat different. Um, I, you know, I think it's, it, it's often really difficult to detect all the vulnerabilities in a system we see this all the time with you know issues with legacy code and so on that that, that attackers um, identify and exploit rapidly uh, then we you know tend to respond with a patch or a fix for that problem so so that's probably still going to be the case um, but but certainly I think you know as we get to, towards a more um, uh, generalized AI if we can get towards that sort of thing in the next 10 years where we're not necessarily dependent on on loads and loads of data but but we're actually what we're doing is creating a more context aware um algorithmic system where it can sort of almost it's, it's a lot more difficult than the strategic games of, of of chess and go that we've seen because of the diversity in it systems and the and the variety of rules if you like but if we can get towards that i think making inroads to that over the next 10 years it'll be really interesting to see um, you know how how we can scale up this this detection of of, uh, of early stage attacks and, and provide automated response that that takes a little bit more um, a little bit more independent control of of the cyber response and and but still as I say brings people along with it. Um, and how do you see the potential commercial commercialization or rollout of this technology, bearing in mind that it's virtually impossible to have a foolproof system that will detect and stop every potential attack? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good one. So I I, th I think realistically, we need to have much more infrastructure where we can demonstrate these these technologies. You know, I, I think um, every every system is different, clearly. But, um, you know, I think if we if we had an, an environment where where industry and academia could sort of converge, um, how, you know, we, there's a lot of talk around digital twins, creating digital twins for different types of system. Uh, deploying different attack scenarios on that digital twin and seeing how these automated uh, systems defend and work alongside people is key. This is something that we're building at Cardiff University uh, is this kind of environment for, for gaming as opposed to cyber gaming that includes the algorithmic side, automated attacks, automated defense and the consideration of the human factor elements. So considering um, uh, working with our psychology team, the, the, the sort of the cognitive overload, the trust in the system, um, and, you know, how people interact with different types of interface, whether it be data driven uh, or, or, or something more anthropomorphic. So lots of stuff happening in that space. Mm, thank you. So we've had a question um, come through uh, about quantum technologies, quantum computing. Um, so, I mean, there's 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 always a debate around quantum computing and whether we'll ever get there and um, whether that will be feasible or not. But 
what, what part do you think quantum technologies might play in securing our cybersecurity future? Yeah, I'll, I'll be brutally honest. I, I, I actually don't know. I'm not I'm not a quantum guy. My my sort of understanding of that is it's going to have a big impact on the way we sort of in, in, in secure our communications um, and the cryptographic protocols, etc. cetera, uh, in, in terms of how, how that links into um, AI. I mean, I think that the future of AI itself is, is massively uncertain how, how we can sort of build these systems that are not just data driven, but can you know, can really make rapid decisions in, in many different ways with, with sort of big matrices of options. Um, how how quantum plays into that, I'll be brutally honest, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not even going to yeah, try and flag that one. That, that's that's fine. When I saw the question, I thought that's quite a, quite a tough one because, yeah. you know, nobody can really determine whether we'll ever get to a position of quantum, yeah. quantum computing um, at this stage anyway. Um, so thanks for that. Um, it, so you you mentioned you'd, you'd been working with Airbus um, and you talked about having secondments and PhD placements, uh, which really helped driving forward your research at Cardiff University. Do you think working with more companies and real life data situations um, and a, a somewhat sponsorship sponsorship approach is key to bringing on advancements in AI and cybersecurity? Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, the inroads that we've made, you know, we've done lots of stuff that's uh, research council funded, which is which has led to excellent outcomes. Um, but really getting those validated and tested in the industry setting has been super important. So those those projects that have been research council funded that we've had the most success with have been partnered with industry stakeholders. So the, the, the main thing is that we don't develop research that is, um, you know, what, what we think might work as academics, you know, naturally we, we tend to, you know, in, innovate with the methods and come up with methods and algorithms and approaches to solving a problem. Um, I suppose that's our role, but the problem itself and the challenge that needs addressing, we are always try and get from our industry partners. The reason being it's, you know, these are the guys who understand the pinch points. They, they know what works and what doesn't work in their setting. They know what keeps them awake at night. Um, they, they, they know, you know, to some degree, what, what, what is the options available in terms of existing technology on the market and they know what they still can't solve. So, you know, our, our approach has always been to work with our, with our key partners in industry to, to shape those problems first and, and government, of course, you know, we do a lot with it in the NTSC. Um, so, it's, you know, it's looking at those those national um, level and, and industry level challenges um, and, and scoping those out and then aligning our research to, to make sure that we're addressing those. And then, you know, it's, it's not a case of, oh, we've done this. Do you want to see how it works? It's, it's regular, um, regular interaction, which happens and, and you know it, the most successful stuff has happened through that secondment to that it, phd placement based approach where we're able to have people out on site multiple days a week working with the in-house team throwing ideas around pitching it to executives and to sort of understanding what their perspective is really trying to communicate what the step changes in these these tools um and yeah you know i think for industry they 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 really appreciate it they really get it i think they really get value from it as well so the the our ethos is still to try and do that as much as we can so if if industry um uh, corporations are interested in getting involved with the university to collaborate on similar sort of projects would they speak to you about it or, or is there another route that they go yeah no definitely so our, our, our approach is always you know we've got an open door uh, you can go on our website uh the center for Cybersecurity research website at cardiff university and there's a sort of a brochure on there that gives you highlights of the research areas that we cover they're, they're very broad as i as i covered in my talk um get in touch and we've got a really great dedicated uh, sort of business development team that'll that'll help um you know sort of uh, get those discussions up and running um and and get us to where we need to be in terms of um, collaboration so de definitely please get in touch fantastic good so um I, I i was listening to your talk and i was thinking about how this technology could be not just transformative in terms of business continuity and um you know dealing with and tackling and and basically cutting out the market for ransomware attacks, but also how it could potentially impact cyber cyber insurance. Uh, because of course, if you can, if you can prevent ha uh, ransom attacks happening, then you don't have to pay the, you don't have to pay the, the, the ransom. Um, then that could massively drive down in cybersecurity premiums and completely change the, the space for cyber insurance. So I'd be interested to see how that plays out. Did you have any, did you have any thoughts around that? Yeah, that's an interesting one. So not not you know not 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 something I've really done anything around, but it is something that's sort of come up in discussion. 
Um, and yeah, you know, I mentioned at the end of my talk about the audibility and the transparency of these decisions. Um, you know, I think, as I've said, in the next 10 years, I can't really see us moving towards full autonomy. Um, but, they, you know, there could be elements of if we can demonstrate that some of the autonomous system, you know, works and, and you know, there's, there's levels that we can take that to that might be sort of analogous to, you know, current um solutions such as you know firewalls intrusion detection systems you know it, it, it it's feasible that over that period we could get towards um you know additional mitigation that could reduce insurance premiums if we can if we can demonstrate that they work and 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 the insurance companies have trust that they work and that they integrate well with existing processes and governance and all, and, and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um it'd be super interesting to to, in to see the flip side of that uh, is is you know where do you draw the line on liability you know to what degree um once we get to that point can insurers say well, well you know you, you didn't have this so you know we're not going to pay that bit or you know or you know vice versa it's, it's, that's an interesting discussion mm -hmm. it, it comes along alongside the whole discussion around autonomous vehicles and insurance around that and where the liability sits i think that's the sort of game we'd be getting into if we started to make uh cyber security more more autonomous and that's a very much a, na a nascent and, a, and a early stage discussion so yeah that'd be, that'd be a really interesting to see how that pans out fascinating so we've got simon de Boulay doing a session on uh, from lime street brokers who's cyber security insurance guy um, so it'd be interesting um, to see what his thoughts are on that. I might pose him a question on that very topic and see what he thinks, because you can see how in health insurance, you know, um, vitality, promote use of wearables. And if you have wearables and they, they reduce your insurance premiums for life cover, you can see a similar sort of application here for companies that use this type of AI a led technology for their cybersecurity strategy, then tying that in with their insurance um, offering. So um, I know we're some way off that now, but but that could certainly be interesting for the future. It, it certainly will, you know. And I, and I sit on the UK government's AI council, and and one of the key things that we're trying to sort of achieve there is is your narratives that will lead to adoption. And 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 one of the you know, it's so different, it's so difficult because it's, it's so broad. You know, you've got the public perception, the industry perception, the different sectors of industry, and the perceptions within that as well. Um, you know, when it when it comes to things like uh, you know insurance, the definitions are key, and, and and actually even defining AI is really actually quite difficult, um, and it'll be it'll be get even more difficult as we move. You know, at the moment, a lot of the you know stuff that's that's branded, I suppose, is AI is data driven. It's it's data informed machine learning, but over the next ten years, I think we'll see a shift towards you know more sort of knowledge representation and reasoning, where where it's a lot more you know perhaps rule based. Um, maybe based on simulation or digital twins etc uh, or partly involving data so then you know where does where does liability lie is it with the data is it with the people who created the rules is it with the algorithms themselves um it, you know the, the, these are sort of going to be long long lasting and really important discussions over the next decade fascinating so what what an interesting session thank you very much pete for for all of your participation today um and thank you everyone for joining us i'd just like to say thank you for uh, participating thank you for your questions um and if anyone has any questions they want to pose directly um that there's a, a the ability to use typed questions now so thank you you for in joining us and we hope you enjoy the content of the rest of the cyber conference and um it's just before afternoon so good morning and thank you for your time thanks pete and um i'll pass you on to the direct chat thank you